I first became involved in the first energy crisis in the 70s. There was a lot of research going into converting different types of biomass to energy. I was working on giant uh, Pacific kelp and converting that to uh, biogas. Well, you know, the gas prices went back down and there wasn't as much research after that, so I went into different aspects of methanogenesis. So in my career, and that was about 40 years ago, I'm, now, I'm going full circle, I'm going back into biogas, except this time it's with aquaculture waste. So you can only continually recirculate water if you're eliminating all the potentially toxic compounds. The nitrogen compounds, you can get rid of the ammonia, which is toxic, right away with nitrification. That's a microbiological process. Then you get a buildup of nitrates, and the way you can get rid of those is an anaerobic microbiological process called denitrification, another one called anaerobic ammonium oxidation. And with these, you can completely remove the nitrogen from the water and turn it into nitrogen gas, which is harmless. And that way you eliminate the nitrogen from the system. So now you've cleaned that from the water. Another compound that builds up are phosphates, and those we can precipitate out chemically and remove those from the water. And then finally, uh, you have all these solids, the leftover food, uh, the excrement from the fish, that are in the water, you need to get those out if you're going to recirculate it because those will become toxic eventually. And so we separate those with a filter and you have to do something with that. And that's the part of the project, what to do with that waste. Right now, it's expensive to get rid of dry waste. Even if you have a closed system, you're always going to have dry waste. So you have to do something with it. If it's fresh water, you can convert it into a soil additive, but if it's seawater, it's saline, it's salty, and you can't use that as a soil additive as it is. So first thing you wanna do is reduce the volume as much as possible. Now, some places landfill. Well, tipping fees for landfill are only gonna go up. Transportation costs to move solid waste is gonna get more and more and more expensive. So if you could actually take the waste and process it and reduce the volume, you're gonna reduce those costs. In addition to that, in reducing the volume, you also produce energy, then you're offsetting some of the energy costs in the facility. And you can convert biogas um, to electricity and you can convert it to heat. And so you're reducing the carbon footprint of uh, the RAS system then. You can actually generate enough energy to displace 10% of the operating costs of the whole system. So it's a very sustainable approach. So with a, a properly balanced RAS system, we do the pilot system we have at IMET, you know, we monitor nitrates, nitrite, ammonia, and when the system steady state, you'll see all of them rise and then just level off at a subtoxic level and just stay there if it's properly balanced. And you know, we've run systems for nine, 10 months. The only water we add is to replace the evaporated water. Otherwise that water doesn't leave the system. And so if it's balanced, then you achieve this goal of uh, keeping everything below toxic levels. That's, that's the goal of a RAS system. We're looking at how to deal with some of the waste products. Hydrogen sulfide is another issue. It's extremely toxic to fish and humans. Some of the hydrogen sulfide we use for denitrification, but uh, any of the hydrogen sulfide that we get in the biogas reactor, and we do get hydrogen sulfide, we don't want that in the biogas. So we've got one project where we're working on dealing with the hydrogen sulfide to get those levels down so the gas is cleaner. Then I mentioned before the desalination of the waste so that we can uh, use it effectively and trying to optimize that anaerobic loop for nitrogen treatment. We know we can do it, but what we want to do is understand the consortia so that we can develop molecular monitoring tools and really monitor what's going on and see if we can further optimize it. Uh, if we can further optimize it, we could reduce the size of the bioreactor, require the retention time and so forth, make it as efficient as possible. And then finally, two other people in our group, they're working on modeling the systems, the composition of the effluent that comes out of a RAS under different conditions. And so they could predict how clean the effluent is going to be. And this is important uh, if you're going to install a RAS system uh, you want to be able to convince regulators that anything coming out, and, and you're always going to have something come out, you know, some water, some waste, just at a very small level, but anything that comes out of the system meets regulatory limits. I think, you know, in this 
day and age of high uh, energy costs and the efforts to reduce the carbon footprint, uh, it, it makes sense to try and extract as much as you can from everything going into the system. You know, it doesn't make sense to throw waste away if there's, there's value in it. And, you know, and if you can obtain energy from it, well, that's value for the plant. Inevitably, that biogas is coming from leftover food, it's coming up from the digested food, and that's energy. And to throw it away in a landfill doesn't make any sense. So our goal is to try and make this a smaller carbon footprint, more sustainable. And I think for a aquaculture facility, a RAS facility, that's a real selling point to be able to say you're doing that.